God's grace and His mercy, His peace be with you today through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Great to see all of you tonight. Hope you're having a great week. Let's take a look at God's Word and see what good words He has for us tonight in Ephesians chapter 6, the last chapter of the book of Ephesians. And we're going to start there with verse 1. We had a great talk last week on husbands and wives, and hopefully we're putting those things into practice as best as we can. With God's help to love our wives and... Uh, and uh, for wives to respect their husbands. All right, so here we are into the other parts of the family. These are, you know, Paul always uh, gives the doctrine of the gospel and the grace of God first in his letters, generally, and then moves to the uh, instructions for living it out towards the end of his letter. So here we are on now the family relationships, not just husband and wife, but children, parents, etc. So let's take a look. Children. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Okay, let's just stop there for a moment and let's look. So there's a word to children. Paul is addressing children. He doesn't often address children. We're all children of God, of course, but is there any other time he's addressed a child? I don't know, except in the Colossians he also says the same almost exact words as Ephesians. A lot of Ephesians and Colossians are almost identical. So if you memorize both letters, it's very tough to keep the two uh, separate because they sound so similar with just a few minor variations on certain verses. But, okay, so children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Okay, obey is Hupakuo, so hupa, hoop, which is under, and akuo. What does that sound like to you? Acoustics, acoustics. That's an easy way when you're learning Greek to remember. Akuo means to hear. Acoustics, we get the word from it. So hupakuo is to listen under. Basically, children are to listen under the tutelage of their of their parents. Listen to what your mom and dad say. So. Uh, there is order in the home, we already saw, that the husband is the head of his wife, but also that the parents, both husband and wife, are the head, are the, the authority, that is, over their children. Uh, so the children are to obey both father and mother. So notice the authority is given here in the wife that the mother should be obeyed. Like, remember the husband is to be obeyed? Well, the children are to obey mom and dad. And... Um, the mother, actually, women are called in the Bible, whether you're a mother or not, uh, you're to be uh, domestic rulers of your own households. So you have power and authority over the nest. Um, I think the word there in the Greek is hoika despotes or something. I think it's hoika despotes. House despots, house rulers. You rule your households. Make sure they run well, you're in charge. Uh, and part of that is uh, taking care of, instructing your children. You know, in the book of Proverbs, we often hear, you know, you should listen and keep the commandments of your father and the, and the words of your mother, that they be a fair garland about your neck, etc. And then all your ways will prosper. And teach them. You're, so that's only if your mother and father are good and they're teaching in the right way. I mean, you should always obey them but, in anything you can, but hopefully the father and mother are giving you good instruction in the Lord. Um, and he says, this is right. It's the right thing to do. There's a right and a wrong. Remember Dick Barber, our good elder, he said his dad told him once, remember son, when he was, I think he was going into the Navy and leaving home and everything, remember son, there's right, there's wrong, and there's nothing in between. And he remembered that, and I've remembered that ever since. It's very clear, isn't it? In our world of befuddled morals and and misty, dreamy, uh, washing away of boundaries of this and that, and it's just a mess, but not with God. Everything's very clear. This is right to obey your parents in the Lord, children. Uh, the word uh, children is just uh, uh, technon. Interesting enough, they're into technology these days, but that's not the meaning of it, of course. Uh, it's uh, the children, the sons and daughters, are to hupakuo, listen to under 
their parents, mom and dad, for this is right, dikaios in the Greek. And then it says, um, honor your father and mother. What is he quoting? From? Ten Commandments. Why does he say this is the first commandment? It's not the first, of course, in the ten words. It's the first one with a promise to it. So actually in the Greek, uh, sorry, in the Hebrew, I mean, Old Testament, if it's the Ten Commandments, you know what that is in the, in the Hebrew, is the Ten Devarim, the Ten Words. That's what they would be called. You can call them commandments, but the actual word means the Ten Words to get to us. Um, and so the uh, first commandment with a promise. So all the other commandments are do this, but this one has a promise attached to it. What was the promise? Exodus 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Exodus 20. It's also Deuteronomy 5. But, uh, so that you, your days, may be long in the land which the Lord your God gives you. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? If you keep your, if you are obedient to the authority and the commandments of your parents and the Lord, God's going to grant you a what? Generally speaking, this is not a hard, fast, in every case thing, but a long life. A long life. Um, so the word for long, live long is macro, macro, uh, chronios, chronology, you know, time. A long time in the land which the Lord your God gives you. So if you want to live long on the earth and enjoy good days, obey your parents. Now, is that a hard and fast rule in every case? Are there righteous children who die early? Are there wicked ones who live long? At times, yes. So just like all of the book of Proverbs, um, this is the way God generally works. If you keep the commandments of your parents, you will live long on the earth. And it has a promise attached to it. But you know, in certain cases, and God may bring you home early. Remember what it says in uh, Isaiah uh, 50. Uh, seven? I always forget if it's 57 or 59. But um, 57 says, The righteous man perishes and no one lays it to heart. Devout men are taken away while no one understands. For the righteous man is taken away from calamity. He enters into peace. They rest in their beds who walk in their uprightness. So sometimes, uh, you know, like I had an older brother. I'm one of four children, but he died before I was born. That's why there's a big diff difference between my parents. Sorry my sisters and myself, time-wise. Uh, he was, you know, was a righteous guy, probably. Uh, my brother David, but, um, you know, he entered into peace very quickly uh, with God. Sometimes people die young. I know, like, you know, Scott died young. But look, here's the good word here in that case, uh, that uh, he's taken away from calamity. He enters into peace. So that's a beautiful word as a Christian. But in, in, in basics, though, is people that go against their parents' commandments, get into drugs and violent crime and all these things, they don't live very long, do they? As it says in the Bible, the wicked don't live out half their days, often. Sometimes they live to an old age, but generally no. And if you keep the commandments, uh, you do have that word that you'll live long in the land, which on, uh, long on the earth. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yes. And here he has, he adds obey in the first verse and then Good one. honor of the commandments. Things that she is adding in the sense of obey. Honor and obey, yeah. So they're, they're different concepts. Yeah, they're different concepts, but yeah, and they also go together, but they also are different. They're just distinct, but they're, you know, if you honor the word, so you're keeping the word, but, the, but yeah. Honoring the parents. Yes, and yes, yes. Obeying right. the Lord. Right, 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 right. So obeying yes. the Lord. Yes. Because you can still honor but not obey if they are not in the Lord. You can mm -hmm. honor the parents but not commit murder if they tell you to murder. Mm -hmm. So you're not obeying that. Right. You can still honor them. So. Right. Very good. And I think the, uh, you know, the catechism, Luther expands this out to all authorities, right? That, that you're to honor also the police officers, so you're honor, to honor the civil servants in their positions of authority and parents and pastors and all these things. Everything in the Lord, in as much as you can as a Christian with, without going against conscience and going against God, of course. If they tell you to murder, 
disobey your parents. If the government tells you to do something against the truth, then you have to go with God and not the government. We must obey God rather than men. But, but in everything that we can as Christians, we're obedient to authorities. We respect authority. God's a, a God of authority and order. And even if we have wicked people over us or unbelieving parents, let's say, obey them in as much as you possibly can with honor. Honoring too, interesting, well, the word tamao, uh, honor, regard, reverence, set a price on, acknowledge the status of, even can mean to give financial aid to, honor. But we should honor our parents and not speak poorly of them. <laughs> that's something a lot of kids will do, right? They'll diss their parents as the modern, I, I, that's probably a very ancient now way of saying diss. I'm di I catch up to things very slowly, so. I told you when I was at the gym a couple of weeks, a couple of months ago, or whatever, and I told you I started laughing out loud, and and the lady sitting next to me on the old lady on the whatever bike thing is like, why? Why are you laughing? I was like, oh, I just saw a commercial for sh men wearing shorter shorts instead of down under the knees, and I started laughing because I'm like, I'm so out of style. I'm finally coming back into style. I I'm not the guy to know all the modern words, okay? <laughs> um, but anyway, honor means that you should always. Bring honor to your parents. Don't put them down. Don't speak poorly of them. Same thing, wives, do the same for your husbands. Part of respecting them is don't go out with other wives and, and, and speak poorly of, oh, I can't stand this about my husband and that, which a lot of women do, right? Don't engage in that. Bring honor to your husband. Don't bring anything uh, that would bring him shame. Don't do the same, or do the same towards your parents. Don't speak poorly of your mom and dad preserve their honor. Now that doesn't mean there are certain cases you could say like, well, you know, you know, my dad, uh, well, in counseling you could say my dad did such and such or my mom did such and such and that was really terrible and you can work that through. Doesn't mean you can't do that. But still, do whatever you can to preserve the honor of your parents. Don't put them down and say they were jerks and use bad words about them and stuff because God will judge that. Yes. And so the struggle is how to honor those parents, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, obeying them up until they, they uh, uh, want you to sin. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, a, that's a common yeah. scenario. Yeah, that's very common. Yeah, a lot of people have had parents that don't know the Lord, or you wonder whether they know the Lord or not, right? Or they might not be acting very honorably. Can you still cover their sins? Love covers a multitude of sins. Can you, you know, without... You know, you got to make careful distinctions each time. What's going to be the most helpful for everybody? Maybe you need to talk with your siblings about something that your parent did wrong. You don't, you're not doing it in the heart to dishonor them, but to heal the other siblings and yourself. You can maybe do that. It's part, it's, it has to go with the intent of the heart. Yes? I love your mom. <laughs> right that she would say that, that. How many had uh, believing parents? Both, well, I, I shouldn't even get into the raising of hands of that, but it's, um, it's such a blessing if you have parents that know the Lord, you know? And um, if they're really bad, you gotta do your best to honor them, just like um, Paul honored the, uh, I was just reading that in Acts the other day, when Paul honored the high priest by saying, you know, you whitewashed wall, you order me to be struck and in contrary to the law, to the law, oh, sorry, you're judging me according to the law and contrary to the law, you order me to be struck, you whitewashed wall. Is that how you speak to the high priest? And Paul, remember, backs off and says, sorry, didn't know he was the high priest. For it's written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. That goes along with Biden and Harris and all these other people too, that we're like, whoa, these people are completely going against Christianity in their things that they're doing, but nevertheless, we have to s try to maintain the honor of the title and the office, uh, even if they're going contra, but we, we can mention what they do wrong, but you just don't want to start saying, you know, using bad words and throwing a spur of bad words at them. Hate the sin, but love the sinner. Remember, David did not kill Saul because right. of the position. Yes. That was honoring. Yes. So he wouldn't Right, right. Well, Paul, Saul wanted to kill him, and he was evil, and God had cast him off, but he was still anointed. Even though he was doing evil and going 
really serving Satan by, by trying to kill David. Uh, he had an evil spirit that was moving him. But even so, he's the Lord's anointed. I won't touch the Lord's anointed. Let God do the judging of Saul. David's hands be guiltless. Yeah. David had to do that a couple times, right? With uh, Nabal, when Abigail helped him from, from slaying Nabal. And uh, thank you for keeping my hands guiltless, oh, you righteous woman. Be my wife. <laughs> he had a number of wives. Um, so let's honor and obey and give honor to your parents, even if they're deceased. Speak honorably to them. And that's important to God. That doesn't mean, again, that you can't say, well, this was something I had to wrestle with. This was something that wasn't right in our home or to your siblings. This is something that mom or dad did. How can I deal with that? Or talk with a counselor about it. You can share some of your parents' sins, but, but do whatever you can with the right heart to honor them and cover their, cover their sins in as much as you can do in a righteous way with the right heart. So um, uh, I don't think any of us have had perfect parents either. Probably a lot of sins and brokenness in our houses. Um, it'd be nice if they were all just, you know, everyone had a perfectly wonderful, I don't know, happy days kind of wonderful. Well, they weren't even good. But uh, a nice home where everybody gets along and everybody behaves in a Christian way. A lot of homes, pray, frankly, we're all in different levels of development and uh, in Christ. And we just got to be gracious and uh, try to cover the wrongs as much as we can and heal and do right. So the right thing for children to do is to obey uh, their parents. This is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with the promise that it may be well with you, that you may live long on the earth, have a long life, and good days. See good days. I think children that are young, but it, it never, it's never expires really though. I think my whole life, I mean, Still keep honoring dad and mom even if they're deceased and I'm 80. That's why I'm a little concerned, well, for a number of reasons, Joyce Meyer of years ago, that was, uh, that, you know, not only she is a woman preacher, that's a, that's a problem with the scriptures, but she also would uh, speak very poorly of her dad all the time and, and, and always lay out his sins to the world, to millions of people. And I'm like, Okay, how are you honoring your, your dad? Even though he did sin to you. He did a horrible sin. But you're also dishonoring him. You know? Hmm. Yeah, so... Okay, well, that, that's great. And, uh, yeah, that's a good thing. Um, but we've got to be careful uh, to... to, to have the right heart towards things, these things, and we all sin with our lips at times. So if we sin in these things, just repent, ask God's forgiveness, be forgiven, and let's go in the right way as best as we can in the future with the Spirit's help. Okay, and then, so what should, uh, the next thing is fathers. Don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So the word to the fathers. Not to provoke your children to anger. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Don't provoke them to anger. Parag, uh, sorry, paragizo. Um, to uh, provoke them to irritation, resentment implied, implies moving them to a certain point. You could say maybe a breaking point, anger. So that they just fume under your leadership as father. You think fathers do a good job? Some do. A lot of them don't. Yeah. The one thing I remember about my dad, the only bad thing I can remember about my dad is he knew which lessons were, my brother's lessons were. Mm. And he, I don't know whether he even consciously did it or not, but he knew what to, what to say or what to, to aggravate to just throw him out the door, you know, my brother would go stop him out the door. He was the only one that I know of that could do that to my brother. Mm. Yeah. I can see my dad in that picture right there. Pushing, prodding, yeah, provoking. Just, yeah, and it, you know, like I said, it wasn't every, every time they were together, but it, it was, you know, instinctively, sometimes you push buttons to push the wild enough. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, that's not good, especially if you're, I mean, you can have a little playful. <laughs> I push best, best buttons sometimes, you know. I was joking that I, I had some, what is that, uh, turmeric tea, tea the other time, and, I, and then I just got on a kick. I was like, everything was, everything wrong in the world was always turmeric for the next day or two, and, and she's like, stop saying that! And I'm like, turmeric! <laughs> but this is the kind, that's joking. It's a matter of prodding in a way that you are trying to literally irritate and provoke them, and, and, and delighting in that. Some people delight in just making people get ticked off, knowing how to push the buttons. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and so that creates a terrible dynamic because your child's supposed to now honor you and you're making it really hard to honor. And then... Mm, that's a great one. Hey, that is such a, a word of wisdom. That should be written... Uh, if I had a big chalkboard, I'd write that out today. I've often thought over the years, uh, you can agree or disagree, that um, we spend our first five, six years or so developing after we're born into the world, and we spend our, maybe our first 10 years, let's say, and then we spend our next 70 or 80 years trying to fix what went wrong in the first 10. Fathers have such a huge responsibility to do their best, and we're all fallen creatures, okay, we're even redeemed as Christians, we're not perfect, but we need to do our best to, uh, to portray uh, God, or act in a fatherly way towards our children in such a way that the children, it's very easy for them to know God in truth, that he's a just God, a loving God, a merciful God, a God you can... Um, know and, and uh, be held by, but also who keeps the word and keeps the house running and he's a protector and all these things. But if you mess up with these things and you beat your children, you know, with a belt or something like that, that is, and, and it's an unjust thing and the child feels the resentment and the in injustice of it, it's so hard for them later on to know God as a just and right God. I mean, a lot of people don't want to know God as father because they, they hated their father because they're so terrible. So what we need to do in that case is not remove the name of Father from God, but, but work on redeeming the image of Father by the book and by the God's Word and knowing what a, what a true Father is and how your Father was not that. And you need to just say that, that was a wrong representation. Because we, the first thing we think about our dads is that he's God. We, we often think of him in that fatherly role, and a lot of children will... Mix those two up, just like if they see a pastor, they think, oh, God's in the room. Well, no, it's just the pastor representative. But a lot of people think that. So fathers should love their children, uh, discipline them, bring them up in the discipline of the Lord and the instruction of the Lord. So uh, paideia, uh, the discipline, instruction, and training of the Lord. And in the instruction is nuthesia, teaching, admonition, and warning of the Lord. An ethical and corrective instruction with regard to behavior and belief. So bring them up to know the Lord. Make it easy for your children to know Jesus. Make them easy to know God the Father. That's the role of the husband, to do so with a strong hand of mercy and love. Um, you know, uh, I did my best with Naomi. Nobody's, you know, going to be perfect, but I remember we, whenever Beth and I would discipline her, we'd always be sure never to do so in anger, but we would discipline her with a spoon. And we would give her three or two warnings and then a, a discipline if she didn't keep it, usually two, to, two warnings. Okay, we, and we explain it. If you do this again, there will be this, this will be the repercussions of it. And it's not because we don't like you, but because we're gonna instruct you in the right way to go. And then if she did it again, we'd have to get out the spoon and usually she was so worked up, we'd just barely touch her like, about like that <laughs> a lot of times because she was so worked up. And she'd go running in the other room, and then we'd always make sure we came back and gave her a hug afterwards to, to let her know that this is in love, and we're not, we're not against you. We love you. We're for you. We just need to bring you up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord to go in the right way. And she would later tell that to other people. Um, 
that, and she would even tell me, I know, that, well, I know that I need this, and I know that this is because I did it wrong, and yes, I need it, and go for it, and stuff. But um, the other tough thing is our culture, I'm, I'm rambling, but uh, our culture today will not allow you to discipline your children in public spaces, because you can be brought up on crimes, or you can't do that in a classroom anymore or anything, but even parents. So what we would do um, with Naomi, we would just say, Okay, Naomi, if you do that again, you're going to be disciplined when we get home for that. And that was the worst of all, because if she displayed in the store or something, said, okay, that's going to be the discipline when we get home with the spoon. And then she'd sit and she'd think about it the entire time at home to the point that she was absolutely freaking out by the time she got home. It was actually the, a better discipline that way, because she just thought about it and thought about it, because it was, it was delayed. And we got home, I literally would barely touch her with a spoon. She was so worked up and she'd go running away as if it was the worst punishment ever. And then we'd always come back and hug and stuff like that. But you know, with a father should be a kind of person that your child should be able to run into your arms and jump there and fall asleep in your arms and just, oh, I'm playing with daddy, I love daddy, he loves me. And, and, and we're close, but also respecting him that he is the authority and he will be disciplining if you step out of line into something in the proper measure, in proportion to the offense, and for instruction. But not in such a way that it's so terrifying that the child cringes or, or shakes just at your presence. Should be a kind of holy reverence where you honor, you obey, you fear your father, but not in such a way that you uh, you tremble and, and you're not just relaxed around him and joking. You just fear that, yeah, he is an authority and he'll discipline me if I need it. But, but other than that, we're just relaxed, laughing, joking, playing around, hanging out on the couch, laying each other's arms and loving each other. You know. So God help all parents today. And a lot of fathers today are not that or absent, uh, sleeping with a mom and disappearing over the horizon or, or in the home and taking out the uh, belt just for the fun of it. Don't do that either. Um, bring them up, use your authority as a father. Of course, you're all older now, children are grown, but for the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That in everything, and I love what James Dobson once said on Focus on the Family, that when you discipline your child, and it's so always stuck in my head, discipline them in such a way that you are molding and shaping their spirits without crushing them. I thought that was a great distinction. Because if you discipline the wrong way, you can crush the spirit. But if you don't discipline at all, uh, you spare the rod, you're going to spoil the child, and he'll be destroyed through the lack of discipline. So you get a discipline in a way that corrects and directs the will without crushing the spirit. I think that's, that's, a, that's a delicate balance sometimes, but um, one we should all strive for. We good? All right. Oh, I want to say one more thing I wrote in here is uh, um, fathers. We call God Father, right? And we call him Abba, Romans chapter 8. That's one of the proofs that you're actually a child of God when we cry, Abba, Father. That's the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we're children of God. Remember when I was in the ELCA seminary in Gettysburg, they wanted to remove all male language from God and from the Bible. We're going to neutralize God. We're going to neuter him, basically. It's not the Father, it's the Creator. It's not the Son, it's the Redeemer. It's not, well, the Holy Spirit is a little less off that gender oriented and I remember thinking just shaking my head like these people are removing the very name that proves to me that I'm a child of God because if I because when I cry Abba Father that's the spirit bearing witness that I'm a God's son that I'm a child of God when I call Abba Father you're gonna remove that from me there and you're removing from the church in fact you're even proving to yourselves that you're not children of God if you're not gonna call him father but one of the reasons was, oh, fathers can be oppressive and they can be bad. And yeah, well, then redeem the word and the name and the image of father. Don't remove the word father because he is, he wants to be known as such. And he's a good, he's the best and only perfect father. And we love him for it. Okay, we're going to go on. Yeah, we'll get down to, okay, good. That'll be good because we'll get down through this and then we'll pick up on the armor of God next week. But well, let's do slaves next. Verse five. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your earthly masters with fear and trembling, 
in singleness of heart as to Christ, not in the way of eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same again from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Then he's going to have a word to the masters. So is slavery wrong? Some, somewhat of a trick question. Um, yeah, so it depends because slavery ultimately, according to the original design, is wrong. God never designed man to own other men. But on the other hand, God gives rules within the fallen world, like he does for divorce, right? When Moses allowed two, three wives, or, sorry, he allowed um, divorce because of their hardness of heart. God set up certain rules. Okay, you're sinners. This is not my original design, but I will allow divorce because otherwise you'll kill each other, basically. For their hardness of heart, Moses allowed it. God sets up in a fallen world, which has slavery in it, rules to make it fair and just and kind, even though it's not his original design for man. All right. And there are uh, good rules for, um, for this. God, uh, for example, says, well, I was going to do some other things here. Exodus 21, when you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve you six years, and in the seventh year, you shall let him go free for nothing. So if you have a Hebrew slave of your brother, and yes. Yeah, that's a big one. Mm -hmm. You sold yourself into slavery to pay your debts. Well, it's actual slave, but yeah, I mean, it's like an employer. It can be like an employer, employee. Yeah, but I mean, you're actually owned, you're bought. If you're captured in war, too, you can be sold as slaves. But also, like you say, if you couldn't pay your debts, you're sold. You can sell yourself. That's sort of your bankruptcy, so you don't die. <laughs> um, declaring bankruptcy. If, it would be nice if you could declare bankruptcy and just wipe out all your debts that way, but you can't do that in the ancient world. Um, you know, a third of the ancient world at the time of Paul, about, were slaves. So this is a huge institution. It's not God's original design, but let's give you some rules to make it fair and kind and just. You let your Hebrew uh, slaves go free, etc., on the seventh year. If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you, he shall serve you six years, etc. Um, then sometimes uh, slaves would stay, and there's a way to do that yet. Yeah poke his ear with an awl if he wants to stay with you, if you like him and he likes you and he wants to stay your slave. A lot of people choose slavery in the ancient times because they love their masters. You know, it doesn't have to be like you see in the movies. Also, it wasn't racist. It was just, you know, it wasn't based on the color of your skin or your race. It was uh, for other reasons. You know, you're captured in war, you're sold into slavery for your money or whatever. So it wasn't, it wasn't racial, like we think in America, all slavery is ra you know, race type of stuff. That's not what it was in the old, old world. And then this jubilee year, in the 50th year, you had to let everybody go free, remember? Uh, you can keep slaves that are from other nations in different ways, but even then, I don't have all the scriptures here, but there were all kinds of rules for treating them fairly and not being overly harsh, even though some of the things sound kind of harsh. But uh, God is saying here about also, with masters and slaves, what their relationship would be. So, ma slaves, be obedient to those who are your earthly masters. Same word, actually, hupakuo. Same word as the children are to be obeying their parents, listening to them and obeying. Uh, to your earthly masters. Earthly, namely, you have a heavenly father, a heavenly master and Jesus Christ is your master, but to your earthly masters, you're in the position of a slave, be a good slave. Being a Christian doesn't mean you, you can be disrespectful to your master, rather you should serve all the better, since those who benefit by your service are, uh, if you have a believing master, then you should serve even better. Don't, you, you don't just throw away your slavery. With fear and trembling and singleness of heart, as to Christ's, so this can go kind of what you were saying there about employees and employers, since we don't have slavery now. 
Well, treat your, uh, treat your employer as if you're serving Christ, whether he be a Christian or not. You know, you're, and uh, similar things for us. Okay. Uh, not in the way of eye service as men pleasers, you know, not just trying to flatter to gain advantage, but as servants of Christ, as if you're serving the Lord himself, as if all the things that you're doing are doing, you're doing it for Jesus, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to men. I used to think about this verse when I'd have to clean and fix toilets on the schooners up in Maine. I was thinking, this is disgusting. I'm having to do some things here that I really foul, kind of. But I was like, hey, let's, let's, let's use this as an opportunity to, to humble my heart, to take a lowly position, to do the lowest possible job in the best honorable way I can. You know? Um, Yes. Sure. Yeah. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. In fact, he sends an uh, Anesimus back, right? Yeah. It says, uh, but then he encourages Philemon, do the good thing. Uh, treat him no longer as a slave, but as a, a brother, and set him free. Yeah. <laughs> Um, not that it was under compulsion or order, he had to do it, but he says, come on, uh, I don't want to have to do this ordering you to do it. Uh, let it be of your own free will. Do the right thing. So, um, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same again from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. So, um, whatever you do, God will repay you for it. If you're a slave, serve as if you're serving Christ. Because every last little thing you do for your master on earth, Jesus will say, I'll consider that as if you did it to me, and I'll reward you on the last day, and even in this life. That's important, isn't it? It's a good, good word for us in uh, obeying people and uh, serving them in this life as if unto Christ. All right, let's finish up here. Masters, do the same to them and forbear threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is that there is no partiality with him so that's believing slaves and believing masters uh, master by the way is kurios in the greek which is sir same word for lord uh, lords uh, kurios is masters sirs do the same to them and forbear threatening in other words the same thing as parents shouldn't be provoking their fathers shouldn't provoke their children masters should not in this case especially, threaten their slaves. So that's the way normally sinful people work, right? If you're some, you have someone under you, you have an employer, and you're, you have employees under you, a lot of people are real terrors, go on tirades and uh, belittle and uh, yell and, and threaten and scold, and they're just a big pain in the neck to live with. Don't be that way. Uh, treat them instead, uh, remembering that you have a master in heaven and he's watching. Treat them as you would treat Christ, really, knowing that there's n and there's no partiality with him. He, whether you're a master or a slave, with God, you're both equal. These are just earthly positions, just same as husbands and wives, male and female. You're also equal in God's eyes. He's not going to judge according to positions and titles. If you are equally then to be judged and stand before the Lord, then do your positions in your particular, do your duty in your particular positions with knowing that God is having an ever careful watchful eye over you. Slaves, obey. Masters, be kind. Treat them well. That's good, isn't it? If you're going to have to have slavery in the world and a third of the world is slaves, wouldn't it be a nice home if the slave served his master as if it were Christ himself and, and, the, and the master as a Christian treats his slave kindly and, uh, and you know, takes care of him. That's what masters do. It must have been amazing when we have these meetings where all these Christians came together. They would be masters in there. Sure. They would be slaves sitting right next to them. Yeah. Yeah. You, know? you could have a good relationship, too, between a master and a slave, can't you? Remember the Roman centurion? He had a slave that was very dear to him. Oh, I just, I mean, he's my great friend. 
think of some of the movies you see, like Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice types of things where they have indentured servants or whatever, and these people are serving the house. And uh, sometimes they have great relationships, and they just love them, and they're close. And you can have a, if you're a Christian and you, and you have a good relationship, good heart, you can have a great relationship with your slave or a, a guy with a butler, you know. You could be very, very close and, and a friend and help each other. Um, that would be a beautiful thing. Um, but don't go scolding and yelling and be a, be a nice person to be around. <laughs> don't, make the, don't make it a terror to have people work for you. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, no, that's true. In the ancient world, you could earn money as a slave. You could have a business as a slave. You could run a, business, a whole business as a slave, and you could earn enough money to buy yourself out of it. Isn't that cool? I mean, you couldn't do that in America and the slaves that we had, but you could do that in the ancient world. So there's, it was a very different from the American slavery. Not entirely, because people beat slaves here, they beat slaves there, but sometimes there were kind people there with their slaves, and there were kind people here with their slaves, and they were very dear and loved to each other. It's dependent on the home. It depends on your, your heart, the heart of the Christian. It's like you can have a, you can have a business, and... Uh, you can have a great boss, and you get along with all of your employees, and everybody has a great time, and you still honor them as your boss, but everybody's working together. You're loving it. Everybody's laughing and having a great time. Or you can have a guy who's a real, or a woman who's a real, like I said, pain in the neck, and everybody's just on pins and needles, and you can't stand being around this person. So if we all strive for being a good Christian, the same could be in a church, you know. Hopefully I'm leading in a way that it makes it a joyful Good experience here. I hope God have mercy. If I'm not, don't talk, don't tell me about it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But we should all work together in love um, with different positions.